Ha! Low Quad has showed up in my mailbox a couple of days ago. The last issue of the C3i magazine. This is a war game magazine that specializes in all things GMT. Articles about GMT games, interviews with designers that have published games with GMT, expansions, play rates, scenarios for GMT games, and also it comes with um, with standalone games. Now, usually war game magazines will come with a game per magazine. This one, this issue, well, you are in luck. It comes with two full games. One is the Battle of VC 1815. Uh, which I will review in a future video. It is in the Days of Glory system, a system that I like very much, probably one of my favorite systems for Napoleonic Warfare. And it also comes with another full war game, which is Gettysburg, simply called Gettysburg, by Mark Herman. Yes, the man himself, one of the most respected designers in war game in history. And now he has given us a small, almost a micro game about the Battle of Gettysburg. It is for two players. It is also playable solitaire by a player controlling both sides at the best of their possibilities with a couple of small adjustments here and there because of at least one element of fog of war, but definitely a solitaire friendly game. Very small, very simple intro level war game about the iconic battle of the American Civil War. Let me show you how the game works. This is the map of the game. It is printed on paper, but it lays flat quite easily. As you can see, I'm not using anything to hold it down. It represents Gettysburg, any area around Gettysburg. It has this nice military map feel to it, which I really like. And at the same time, it is very readable. It has empty, so basic terrain, and then it only has two types of terrain feature that um, that affect gameplay. One is defensible terrain, which is shaded and, and affects combat, and one is roads, and roads affect movement. Now we have two tracks here, two game tracks. One is a turn track, the game will last six turns, so two for each day of the battle, and then we have an artillery track that players use to keep track of how many artillery points they have. Players will want to commit artillery points during combat and you have a limited number of them when you're out of them. Well, too bad for you, you can't use artillery anymore. Now, several concepts. Uh, the game has headquarters. They do not represent anything physical. If the headquarter marker is there, that doesn't mean that Mr. Lee is sitting there. It's a marker, not a unit, so units can sit on it, move through it freely. They simply indicate a general area in which the commander is concentrating on operations, which the focus of the agency of the commander is going to be expressed. So basically there is a range that emanates from the counter and that would be eight for the Confederates and six for the Union. And so you have to imagine this area here that again for the Confederates covers pretty much most of the map, for the Union not so much. Units that start within that area need to stay in that area and units that are outside need to try to get in that area as fast as possible. So this is pretty much what happens, like a magnet for units. As for the units themselves, uh, they are printed on these nice thick cardboard uh, tokens here. And uh, they represent military units that can be in march formation, as you see here, or flipped to the other side, and that is the battle formation. The number that you see there is movement points, so really the main effect of switching from march to battle is the reduced number of movement points that you have. The stars that you see here, they are modifiers that are used in combat. In Gettysburg, so as you can imagine, we're going to have a light defense here from the Union, a group of Confederate units moving in this direction, and then reinforcements from both sides rushing in and trying to fight it out. Probably in this area here, maybe more in this area here. It depends on various factors. Now, as for, as for uh, the turn structure, there are a couple of interesting things here. A turn starts uh, with the players placing their HQs wherever the heck they want, including on top of units, their own units, anywhere. Remember, these are not physical units. And so that indicates where units will mainly act that turn. 
Then you return to the board blown units, meaning one of the results in combat is the unit may be blown. That is, the unit is removed temporarily from the game for two turns. So you place it two turns ahead on the turn track and at the beginning of the turn after you place your headquarters when these units are brought in back to the map. That also means, however, that the blown result in the last two turns equals to an elimination result. They don't have time to come back. So the last turn is particularly bloody. So the last day, which means the last two turns of the game, are particularly brutal. After that um, formation, remember, we can be in march formation, you can be in a battle formation. And something important here is that units have a zone of control, like you can expect from uh, many games, but also have a zone of influence. So the zone of control, the unit projects a zone of control in the six axes surrounding it, but then the unit also project a zone of influence in the ring of axes surrounding the zone of control. When a unit moves into a zone of control, a zone of influence, from battle formation it needs to move, from march formation, I mean it needs to move to battle formation. And then maybe we'll move there next time it moves. So at the beginning of the turn pretty much you check the organization of the units and units that are in enemy zones of control or enemy zones of influence stay or flip to their battle side. And units that are outside of enemies also control or influence stay or flip to their march side. Pretty much, you make sure that everybody who's close to the opponent is in battle formation and everybody who isn't is in march formation. That's for the organization organization phases. Also, this is the area in the time of the turn in which if you want, you can voluntarily exit an enemy zone of control. When you enter an enemy zone of control during movement, you're locked there and you can only exit that voluntarily at the beginning of the turn or as a function, as an effect of combat. Then it is time for the players to move. Interesting enough, there is a movement phase in which both players will alternate moving and when all both players are done moving then you have a combat phase in which both players will declare attacks. Movement! Season War Gamers, brace yourselves. There are a couple of interesting concepts here that probably you haven't seen in many war games, if any at all, which is units can move multiple times per turn. Yes, they can move multiple times during a movement phase. And also then when we are combat, so units may participate in combat multiple times. They may declare attacks multiple times per turn. This goes against some of the most sacred conventions of war gaming, but what can I say? It's the 21st century. Nothing is sacred anymore. So players will alternate moving, units will move up to their full movement allowance, roads will facilitate movement, and when you enter a zone of influence of an opponent, again, you flip to, march, uh, to battle formation. So players will alternate moving, oh, I flip this way, and then, and then I move this one again, and then I move this one, and then it's me, I move here, flip to battle formation, and so on and so forth, and then I want to move there, and like this. So, this is how this is how we do it. We move around multiple times until pretty much players either pass or they may simply be all locked in zone of control so they cannot move. When a player passes, the opponent only receives a number, a limited number of moves. They don't, if I pass early, that doesn't mean that you get to move as much as you want. You roll a d6 and then you add to that a number which is equal to the number of enemy units that have not, they're not in zones of control or that haven't, haven't entered the board yet as reinforcements. So basically when I pass I roll a die and you will receive a number of following movements that you have to bring in reinforcements and readjust uh, units on the board. Which also means that I may try to, if I'm in a good position, I may try to shut down your turn as fast as possible preventing you from getting a better position. 
then it is time to declare combats. Again, a unit may uh, attack multiple times per turn as long as it is still in an enemy zone of control and, well, and you're willing to use it for that. When you declare a combat, first uh, we check what the situation is with artillery. Uh, artillery doesn't have specific game pieces on the board. The effect of artillery is abstracted by using, again, a counter that tells you how many artillery points you have and a marker that you use to determine if in a turn you are in fast spending artillery support or not. But players have a marker such as this one. They hide it under their hand after they set it to one of the two sides and then they reveal it simultaneously to see if they are in fact using artillery support for the present attack. If only one player has committed artillery support, that player again, spends a point and will receive a plus two during combat. If both players have committed artillery support, then there is an artillery duo in which both players surely die and the player that rolls highest gets the plus two uh, bonus for the attack roll. Then, and we only use d6s in this game, then both players roll dice to determine their combat total. So you roll the die and what you roll is your base number to which you add plus two if you had artillery support. The defender only can add plus two if they are defending in defensible terrain. The attacker gets a plus one if there are two or more non-attacking friendly units next to the defender like it would be in that case if I am attacking with that unit there. Also, each unit adds plus one for each star on their attacking unit. So, you compare the two modified results, so you roll and you add all of those for the attacker and the defender, the player with the highest wins, so the confrontation, and the difference tells you what happens to the loser. If you rolled, uh, if the difference is plus one or plus two for the attacker, oh, I mean for the winner, then the loser will retreat and then if he's unable to do so, to meet all the various limitations of retreat, then that is treated as a blown result. If the differential is three to four, then the uh, unit of the loser is blown and so it is move two turns ahead when it will return to the battlefield unless it's July 3rd. The differential is five or more then the unit is simply eliminated. You continue like this uh, turn after turn until the end of the last turn and then you determine victory and victory is based on elimination of enemy units. I like this game a lot. It is definitely, well, within its category, mind you, it's not an epic game, nor was it meant to be, but for an intro level game that is playable in heck under an hour and still has a good degree of historical flavor and still has interesting gameplay elements, that's, this game is quite an achievement. I definitely enjoyed playing it. Now, uh, the game is intro level in terms of complexity. I said that instead of saying introductory war game. There's a reason. To me, a good introductory war game is not just something that a non-war gamer can play easily, and this one is, that's intro level, but also something that teaches you about some of, some of the conventions of war gaming so that then you can use those when you're playing other war games. There's also control, well that's here, but then there are a lot of other conventions that simply this game is not that concerned with. So it is an intro level game that is not necessarily the best introduction to the hobby because then you still have to learn from scratch the idea, wait a second, what do you mean I can only participate in combat once. What do you mean I can only move my unit once per turn? In that game I could do differently. Maybe on the plus side, somebody who is not a war game and does not have to unlearn those conventions, but on the other hand, on the other hand, this is not necessarily the best stepping stone to the hobby. Still play to get a sense of how fun playing war gaming is, but there are so many mechanics that then you can port to other games. And I'm not saying this to complain about the game, I enjoyed it. It's just to, um, to clarify that there are other games such as the classic SPI Napoleon of Waterloo, which are same level of complexity, um, even maybe less, I wouldn't say it's more complicated, but that one has more units, so it takes longer to set up and play. There are games that have similar 
level of complexity and accessibility um, that then also you can spend them better as currents in terms of knowledge about what you learn and you can use. This game is an intro level game that definitely is very enjoyable for something so simple, so uh, linear, so easy to set up and, and then to put away. You can play a full game in less than an hour, in a single evening, you can play multiple times, you can have your own mini tournament, definitely, definitely enjoyable. And I like how the game, again, is so simple and such a low number of units. When I saw the counter sheet, I thought there had to be a mistake, maybe I my copy was missing something. And yet, no, it really works. So you really get to do all that you need to do. Uh, you really get a sense of the main events, the main challenges, because of the reinforcements that come from different directions, then they will, they will tend to clash in different areas. Uh, with this fact, pretty simple, this idea of the zone of influence, that I don't know that I've seen elsewhere, or some of this is not a common idea, that however manages to show you how, well, the formations change, and now you started from maneuvering really fast, and now you're approaching your enemy more slowly, more carefully. It has an historical uh, it has an historical feel and also it has interesting tactical challenges as in fact now you're slow down and you would like to do the final maneuver to get into the perfect position to hammer the opponent from one direction where maybe another unit of yours is acting as the anvil. Um, but then it's complicated as it should be because you shouldn't be allowed to march in front of your enemy units too easily without consequences. We we saw what happened at Pickett's Charge, just thinking about Gettysburg. And so the fact that you're slowing down and you may have a limited number of moves and you may not be able to complete the maneuver, to me that feels historical on top of being interesting in terms of gameplay. So everything is very easy to manage, everything is pretty intuitive, you don't have too many modifiers that you need to worry about, but you have enough that it's fun to want well, to try to exploit them at the best of your possibilities. You have that uh, bluffing game when it comes to artillery, I really like how artillery has been abstracted in such a simple way, yet effective. There are the games in which you have to wear artillery, you can only move on that road, you have to move it this way, limber it, unlimber it, some games. Um, well, here people still are gonna get mowed down by artillery. If the situation applies, it still works, you still have the historical factor, you still have the advantage of the union in terms of material supplies as the Union has more uh, artillery uh, to spend. So definitely had that interesting bluffing element. Uh, you have a little bit of random there if, if there's an artillery duo that, however, does not, I don't think it off offsets things too much. I don't think it really makes things too random, nor, as I feared as I read the rule book, nor does it turn uh, things into, nor does it make things too fiddly, it's just a micro phase that you may have to resolve in some combats, and it's exciting to see if you're gonna actually get to use your artillery effective or not. So, you don't have many modifiers, but those are relevant when you roll a d6, so having a plus two or a plus three is huge. So again, that really gives you an incentive to not just send units randomly there, but to exploit terrain, to exploit your best units with the starts at the best of their possibilities. It makes a tactical understanding of the battlefield worth it. It makes you want to really pay attention to play, um, to play with the best strategy, or I should say tactics that you can have. That is, again, to say that it's a game that is so small, doesn't have many units, but precisely because of that, each unit matters, each unit counts, each maneuver, each position uh, matters. And so that makes gameplay feel significant, feel relevant, and of course, in the process, exciting. It is a very simple game. You can play with non-war gamers, and I think they will get it. Again, in a sense, maybe some of them will get it even better than, than season war gamers, because they don't have to unlearn uh, some basic concepts. But in general, it is a really good game for the small game that it is. It is a just really... It is a really strong filler war game, if there can be such a thing. On top of the fact that it comes packaged with a great magazine and with a full other game, well, that, I think, is, makes 
really good value for your money if you decide to get this issue of C3i magazine. In general, Daffody had a fun time playing Mark Herman's Gettysburg, and I can't wait to try Battle of VC because I know that system, I know I like other games in that system, and so hmm, I have very high expectations about this one. In general, well, good package for what I've seen so far, and definitely a good game when we're talking about Gettysburg by Mark Herman.